Carolyn's tea box contains tea from plants that were caressed and praised hourly as they grew. Who's a good little tea plant? You are. <laughs> Happy tea that sings a little song as it steeps. Tea with unicorn sprinkles. Tea with unicorn sprinkles and fragments of the true cross. Smart tea that knows where you left your car keys. <laughs> tea that knows the meaning of life and if you play your cards right, it might tell you. Apple eye tea that brews and pours itself <laughs> and can download new kinds of tea from the Apple uh, website. <coughs> Apple is developing a tea that can drink itself, but that's not expected to hit the market for several more years. Super tea, which is made from a tea plant whose seeds were aboard the spacecraft that Kal-El escaped from Krypton in. <laughs> On Earth, a single tea bag makes an ocean of tea. Uh, the same bag on Krypton only makes a cup. <laughs> tea made from the leaves of the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Very hard to get these days. <laughs> Creation tea, which God drank on the seventh day while he was relaxing and looking over his work. He pronounced it good. And of course, the crown jewel of her collection, tea with oranges that came all the way from China. Alice wants to walk the dirt road. Officially, it's spring. We watch snowflakes floating past the window panes, listen to the water drip dripping from the gutter. We pull on fleeces, but won't make more concessions to chilly air, wanting the sun to whisper in our ears, spring has come. Alice dances up the ridges, prances through the puddles, stomps poems with her sneakers, tosses pebbles into songs. I plod along behind her, searching budded twigs. I need proof springs come. Alice scoops up fallen oak leaves, the sun melted, and they've come back to me. I'm too busy seeking signs of new life and don't care about her dead leaves. She's gathered up a bouquet, waves it for the sun to see. The snow melted, and they've come back to me. She throws the leaves up high, fluttering with them to the ground. I ignore her miracle, looking for a robin, or a flying insect, or a polywog in water. Let's find frogs, Grandma. How can they breathe underneath the ground? When will they come alive again? Alice takes a stick and pokes it in the dirt. She forms the letters of her name, a-L-I-C-E. Proclaiming for the world to see, she learned to write her name this winter. Now you write yours, Grandma. I do. It feels like the most important writing anyone can do. I cut budded twigs. Alice calls them fat. They must be pregnant like the cat. She can't imagine they will bloom, but is patient while I keep collecting, then flies like a siren in the wind back to the door where Gus, her yellow lab, is waiting. Do you have a dog, Grandma? I tell her Tony, my cocker spaniel, and his successor Susie are both long dead. Will they come back like the brown leaves and flowers? I shake my head. Alice, quiet for a moment, perks up. Gus is leaning on your lap because his grandma's dead. So you can be his grandma and he can be your dog. She pats him on the head. I place the budded twigs in water 
stand the vase beside her bed. She arranges brittle oak leaves in a glass placed by the vase and says, the buds are getting live again and the leaves are getting deader. <laughs> Marching on May Day, 1948, I am eight years old, watching the parade with my mother, Margie, waiting for our turn to march. The first marchers coming down 8th Avenue are the Spanish Civil War veterans in U.S. Army uniforms. We press to the edge of the sidewalk. That's my father, I shout as they swing into view with George and three other former officers out front carrying American and Spanish flags. Hundreds of people cheer their hearts out for my father and the other veterans. May Day parades are not like other parades. There are no marching bands, no girls in cute red and yellow uniforms twirling batons, no fancy floats, giant balloons, fire engines, or soldiers carrying guns. Instead, it's just thousands of people carrying signs and banners, singing and chanting. United Electrical Workers Local 47, Teaneck, New Jersey, or ILGWU, International Ladies Garment Workers Union. A few hundred high school and college students pass by with a banner saying, Labor Youth League. My mother leans over and says, you'll march with them when you're in high school. <clears throat> Finally, it's our turn to march. I pick up a sign that says, no more war, just like the button I'm wearing. Margie and I take turns carrying it till our arms get tired and we pass it to someone else. Marching down the middle of 8th Avenue with police blocking the side streets is even more thrilling than watching my father. People along the sidewalk cheer as we chant, Jim Crow must go, and one, two, three, four, we don't want another war, five, six, seven, eight, we want Wallace in 48. I don't know who Wallace is. Loud cheers resound from each new crowd of bystanders. Sometimes we stop for red lights while traffic crosses the avenue. Mostly, we are waved on past lines of honking crosstown traffic. As we turn to march east on 17th Street, my father, in his Army Air Corps uniform, jumps into line with us. I am secure and confident, holding both my parents' hands as we march the last half mile to Union Square. The cheering echoes loudly between the tall buildings. As we chant, we don't want another war, I know I'm part of something much larger than myself. At Union Square, Pete Seeger is singing about ending Jim Crow. He throws his head back, pounds his banjo. Oh, I hate Jim Crow and Jim Crow hates me. That's why I'm fighting for my liberty. Hallelujah, I'm a traveling. Hallelujah, ain't it fine? Hallelujah, I'm a traveling down freedom's main line. Thank you. I have this old dog. He's nearly blind, can hardly see. He trips over the black cat on the dark green rug at dusk and stumbles on stairs, once launching himself recklessly down half a flight to avoid the uncertainty of where to place his paws. He's deaf as a stump until the doorbell rings. Then he lurches to attention like the nutty professor in Back to the Future ready to defend his castle. For two years, we lived in a place with no doorbell, and when we returned, he'd forgotten that doorbell spelled danger. That was nice while it lasted. He bites when I try to pick him up, but his teeth are worn and his gums sore, so he's just a shadow of his former ferocity. And the indignity can't even get his teeth cleaned or pulled because the next time he goes under anesthesia, he's down for good, and I'm not ready for that. When we walk in the rain, he winces with every assault from an unseen enemy he tries vainly to avoid. It's hard watching my dog grow old. He was never fat, handsome and lean in his prime, but now his flesh has wasted away. Bones protrude like a baby bird, fragile as a whisper on a windy day. 
He tucks up into a tiny ball to sleep, curls up into himself, a nested comma or parentheses around pure love. And his eyes, let me tell you about his eyes. To appreciate my dog's eyes, you have to know something about his eyebrows and about my daughter who is obsessed with drawing eyebrows on him so he doesn't get a complex from having a naked face. I came home one day a few years ago and he bounded to the door to greet me, a quizzical, comical look on his fawn face enhanced by expressive dark eyebrows. Under those undignified eyebrows lie the most adoring eyes a person could ever be lucky enough to see. Even now, clouded by cataracts, they beam unconditional love that I barely deserve. He makes me a better person with those eyes. With love like that, how do you decide when it's time to close the curtain on this life beyond the inconvenience of incontinence and not having company because it sets him on edge till he paces relentlessly in a rush to get nowhere? How do you decide when love should die? My plan for now is to pray each day that when it's time for him to leave this mortal life, that he lay his head down and drift away so the decision doesn't have to be mine. At seven, school year finished. Summer cottage on the shore was ours again. My parents planted on the blanket out front, oiled and oblivious, cocktail thermos empty, I was free to roam mile-long sand. Fry pan sun sizzled above, framed by an ice blue sky. Sweat dripped down my forehead. Mirage pooled in the distance. Each footfall skimmed sand with a screech. The staccato crash of surf caused arms to unfurl in dizzy circles of pirouettes. A sudden breeze kicked up. Empty porch swings swung. White caps formed on water. A bird called out my name. Looking back, our cottage was a distant tent pitched in an army of roof peaks marching in sand. I became cold. Long arm of boulders jutted into sea, restraining currents. The jetty beckoned me to climb up. Fishermen wore wide-legged yellow oilcloth with suspenders, poles in hand. Fish churned in their empty metal, in their metal pails. Wind whipped away breath. A child cried mutely. Angry mercurial waves pounded from both sides. Deep sea left its rancid breath on slick stones. I fell, scraping skin on barnacles. My hero stranger released me. He spoke, but all I could hear was roaring. I thanked him with the wild light in my eyes and ran stopped to rinse a bloody knee and ran again. Wind slapped the body like a restless, breathless racehorse, gaining on home stretch, losing power, straining to reel in familiar faces. Skylight sputtered out, my teeth chattered. I sit now on cottage steps under a blanket drinking milky tea Words track ink across the page. Cat leans up against my legs, threading in and out. She listens, purrs, tale of the fish that got away. Thank you. That day I saw him in the glass dismantled me. I turned my head and stared to find the source of him in memory behind, set there at yesterday, yet carried forward to this time. So many times I'd sworn myself to change, be tall, not short, and swift, not slow, and bright beyond the dullness of his mind. 
yet most important, sensitive and kind. Fresh start set me apart, above, I thought, and all that time I had to grow allowed a distance to be mined, raising myself above his given line and striding on to love. Then, self-assured, I scaled the towers of dreams, crowned my good with all deserved praise, reached the heights that would not be denied, imagined glory, then paused to rest self-satisfied. What did I know of short or slow or dull? Not mine these faults ever left far behind, locked in a past I chose to unremember. I only looked ahead to new rooms I could enter. Yet even then my tall was growing short. My swiftness slipped back in the youth-led pack and dullness left a film on bright ideas. Unexpected, a brief breath of mean spirit fouled the years. Time's truth had put a lie to all my dreams, and what had I advanced through all these years but an image of who I would not be, cast forward in that mirror and staring starkly back at me. Thank you. Lady Spring, you bless us so with your delicate fragrance, with your sweet pastel palette that stipples the landscape with gentle grace. Welcome back, Lady Spring, your kindness tempered by reminders not to take you for granted sings in our veins and polishes up our hearts. When you grow weary and retire to sleep the months away, we will remember your fragrance and your gentleness and anticipate your return with great joy. My energy smoked like a fat cone of hashish, baked from an eternity of murky dreams. I emerged from a long sleep, the longest, pouring myself into morning coffee. I greet you. And this is a song called Dream, also having to do with my character, Colmar Eclair, and her life. Sloshing around the time, 500 years to unwind, escape the wars in the mind. Every step lies far behind. Marching information Overcome insult, degradation, reject, attack, retaliation, burn down the altars of salvation. Casting out to find an ally, Blast through the hostile smiles. They eat their bread, they drink their wine. I feast alone on secret skies. Falling, I avoid crossfire. 
Soldiers wearing out their stars, stripped and chained to stone towers, signs of a massive disavowal. Carrying the torch of my desire, this world appears a raw satire, which bitter as it may seem, yet feeds a lovely dream. Welcome to the American Poetry Slam, that high and low, fast and slow, linguistic lightning unforgettable show. It's the way we do what we do, not the who versus who. In verb verse to traverse the adverb and reverse the verse to a verse. And pitch the pitch with interval of syllable against the pretense of past, present, and future tense. The suspense of style and substance the suspense of style and substance, I lost my track, makes an intense oratory performance. From coast to coast, it's the lip smacking supreme word throwdown. Behind the swagger and sway and the hip hop lyric drop is the theme that screams in dream scenes. How long will the homeless be homeless? Women and children subject to rape and abuse. And when? Will sexual and gender preference carry the full weight and power of American equality? As we continue healing the breach, found in civil action, criminal action, lack of action, class action, lack of class, kicking the for anyone still being in A new world order is in order to reorder the disorder for the stability and civility of society. So we're a little verbose, <laughs> outspoken even, in a nation where no one can tell you what to think. A poet can offer you something to think about. As we're clipping it, dipping it, and flip flipping it, rip ripping it, stripping it, and tipping it, whipping it and zipping it, hip hopping, flip flopping, starting and stopping it, creating an ocean of commotion without devotion to emotion. Welcome to the new vocabulary. Freedom of expression, the foundation of democracy. That's your shining U.S. of A, the primo de facto place to be. That's the America I want the world to see. Thank you. Art galleries, restaurants, and villas rise over vanished footprints. Del Boca Vista, pineapple workers, the color of their community. The cottages are all gone. Now there are ready-made for tourists, condominiums, hotels to dine and sip coffee outdoors. I walk suntanned and purposeful on pristine beaches to gather seashells, not fruit where a bridge opens hourly for yachts. People fished those inlets were the life force then. No one knew hippies then. Some whose children inherited a desire for ocean horizons. Pineapple green becomes internet dream. South Florida's tropical sounds wail. Amped up music throbs through monoxide vapors from convertibles. Sound and smoke creeps past curb to cafe diners, while valet drivers avoid motorcycles roar. Waves tumble as extra large plates swirled with balsamic sauce over artichoke hearts become a conversation. 
I too need Del Boca vistas, its rising sea moving with deep treasures buried in its sifting sands. That was my pilgrimage, thanks. I was never accustomed to snow coming from the south. But now I think of how to get through such hard, cold days. We must be like the winter animals. Tell ourselves how to prepare for winter days. Stay warm and safe. Find a way to get through the thick of it, the ice and cold and snow of it. We can do it. You know, now that I live in the North, I realize that once we get through February, we can all march on. <laughs> Let's go. And that's by Edward, and I'm honored to read that. Thank you. in fun and adventurous field trips, we recommend, one, to learn a Girl Scout troop, and two, visiting H Camp to see how local television is created and produced. We also want to give a shout out to Kalala Supermarket to thank Dale for our Girl Scout troop tour. And for always giving us a space to set up our cookie booth. Speaking of cookies, our favorites are, thanks a lot, Caramel Delight, Thin Mints, Thin Mints, Thin Mints. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you! you. <laughs> Here we go. And... Action. We also give it. We also want to give a shout out. Go. This is gonna be the one. You guys, you know, we are the girls from Girl Scout Troop. Hi, we are the girls. We're trained okay, professionals. Here we go, ready? Faces here. Thanks. Smile. Right, here. How do you feel about that? That was awful. That was awful. <laughs> that was awful. Yeah. Cut. Ooh, that's we a did. Yeah. We did. We did.